you guys. And the person I'd like you to meet today is Miss Samni Desai. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've never done、yeah. a podcast, so I'm really excited that. My first one will be in Uzbekistan. <laughs> yeah. I have already graduated with my bachelor, so I studied in Dallas, Texas. I graduated with a bachelor's in political science and international studies. Now I'm here, and then, as you mentioned, I'll be going on to law school. If if it's really cool to be part of that club, but it kind of just feels surreal. Like it doesn't feel real yet. So what is it like applying to Yale University? <sighs> okay, well, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess there's also some fun part to studying law because、um, I actually did study law for one semester back in university. It was commercial law, and we did something called the mood trial.、Uh-huh. We、yeah. used to do something called mood trial. It's basically role play. You get to be a lawyer, a president at the beginning of their term. They're like、mm-hmm. super happy and young and like bright, and they're like, I could change the world. And then, like eight years later, they're like graying and、mm-hmm. like wrinkles, and they look so tired.、Uh, so, what does it feel to be a Texan? What's what's life like in Texas? Captain America like catches the hammer, Thor's that, hammer. That's that's what I had in mind. That's like I think that's like the most <laughs> cliche answer, but it really was like incredible. That's really nice. Another thing that I really like about Uzbekistan is that it's really safe. That's、oh. not even the problem. My my issue is actually that it's not walkable. Like there's not good sidewalk infrastructure. So what what we do here is we help them go from intermediate level to advanced. And then from advanced to native, like then obviously they're gonna need the help of people like you. They would give us a dialogue of somebody ordering at a restaurant and the waiter, and somebody would play a waiter and somebody would play the person ordering, and they would practice that dialogue. Yeah.、Um, because I do think that's like probably the most effective way. Sure, is the same in Russian, which is like ya is this or whatever, right? Yes. So <laughs> I'm like I don't even know Russian that well.、Um, no, that was actually correct. <laughs> You know, what's surprising is you speak Russian better than I do. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Don't want to learn English, then I shouldn't be like sitting in an English class and like wasting my time and the teacher's time. What's your perception of an ideal man? <laughs> How would you define an ideal man? You can put out positive energy, or you can be really self-deprecating and really hateful and negative, and like always have negative thoughts, and that puts out a negative energy. Hey folks! Hey everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Adostra Muse. I'm your host here, Muhammad Ali, and today I got another special guest in the house. And the person I'm going to be talking to today is a future Yale student, and and he, she also happens to be a multilingual. She can speak a bunch of different languages. So I, I'm in for a treat for today, guys. And the person I'd like you to meet today is Miss Samni Desai. Hi, everyone.、Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've never done、yeah. a podcast, so I'm really excited that my first one will be in Uzbekistan. <laughs> yeah. So wait. And before we get going, I'd like to share with our audience a little meetup story, if you don't mind.、Mm-hmm. Sure. So、uh, we, I actually found out about you from the comments section, and so people. There are some students of yours who also come here, and they were telling me they would like to see you on the show next. And I'm like, okay, sure, I'll hit her up. And when I I did, I reached out to you, but for some reason I didn't get a response right away. And I completely get it. <laughs> yeah, and and I did. You, you, you when you finally responded, you agreed, thankfully. And and then I text you another message, and it takes you a couple took you another couple of days to get、yeah. back to me. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought I was gonna get ghost,、uh, ghosted. Yeah, sorry、This. about that. My、um, Telegram and like my phone service.、Uh-huh. If I don't pay my B line, it like cuts off all communication. <laughs> oh. And so I think you caught me in、uh-huh. between like paying for the bill. But、um, also, I'm a little suspicious when、uh-huh. like people reach out to me on Telegram because it's on my Uzbek phone. So、mm-hmm. it's like I I don't always know. Like who is texting me or like <laughs> where this is coming from? But then I talked to Kathleen,、uh-huh. who was on your show last time, and she was like, "Oh no, he's really nice, and you should get to know him. He speaks really good English." And I was like,、oh, "Okay."、Thanks. So once I fact checked, it was it was good. <laughs> I was good to go. <laughs> sure. Thanks for the clarification. All right.、Uh, so, what, would you like to tell our audience now a little about yourself? So, what do you do at the moment? Sure. So I am currently a U.S. Fulbright Scholar to Uzbekistan. So I was placed at Bukhara Innovation Tibiot Institute. It's now a university,、um, Tibiot and Talim、mm-hmm. University,、um, and I teach English to advanced level English speakers.、Um, 
well, like intermediate level um, English speakers. Mm -hmm. And I'll be here for about like nine months. And I have already graduated with my bachelor. So I studied in Dallas, Texas. I graduated with a bachelor's in political science and international studies. Now I'm here. And then, as you mentioned, I'll be going on to law school, most likely to Yale, but I'm still waiting on a few decisions. But Mm -hmm. my heart's basically set. Oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. but still, it's pre pretty impressive. When Thank I you. told my colleagues I'd be having a podcast with someone who's going to Yale one day, I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, surprising to me, too, honestly. Yeah. It's like, it's it's one of the five top Ivy universities, yeah. Ivy League universities in the world, right? Yeah, I think there's, I'm not sure, maybe there's seven or eight Ivies in the mm -hmm. U.S. Honestly, I can't name all of them, but it is one of them, yes. Yeah. So how does it feel to be part of that club? Honestly, that's a really good question because I never thought that I would be part of that club. And in the U.S., like education can be very, uh, what's the word? There's like a lot of inequality in terms of education. So education costs a lot of money in the U.S. It's actually a really big problem. Um, and so one, I never thought I would be able to afford going to one of those schools, which is part of the reason I didn't go to one of those schools for my undergraduate um, study. I, I actually went to undergrad on a full scholarship. So I'm, I'm, I was so lucky that that was made available to me, but going to an Ivy League school or a private, like one of those upper echelon schools was not really like feasible for me. So I never thought that I would end up at one of those schools, but then I tried really hard in undergrad to, you know, maintain good grades and pursue leadership opportunities and, you know, like really understand myself and my interests. Then I took a test, which is called the LSAT, which is like the law school admissions test, wrote my essays. And I genuinely think that teaching in Uzbekistan was one of the reasons that my essays were so good and f like full of so much heart because I actually had things to talk about. And I've seen things here that I can bring back to the U.S., um, things that are different, things that are similar, things that should change, things that shouldn't change. And so I was able to write really good essays. And now I feel like I'm deserving of going to one of those schools. But if you had asked me like three or four years ago or any time before that, I never would have expected to be in that club mm -hmm. um and it just opens a lot more doors i think in terms of like the network and the level of education and the professors and things like that so i don't know reach out to me in another year and ask me <laughs> if if it's really cool to be part of that club but it kind of just feels surreal like it doesn't feel real yet yeah and I, i'd like you to elaborate a little more on the admission process so what is it like applying to Yale University? Okay, well, it's terrible. <laughs> um, so like the first semester that I was here, um, I was working on those applications and I applied to 10 like law schools, um, all in the top, they, they rank law schools in 14. So it's like the top 14 and then there's the top 25 and then there's the top 50. So because of my test score, I decided to only apply in the top 14. I applied to 10 schools and all of them required different essays. So there's one essay called your personal statement where you talk about like, why do you want to go to law school? Like, who are you? What drives you? What are your motivations? Um, and for some schools, why do you want to go to that school specifically? So you write your essay, you edit it and edit it and edit it for like literally months. And then you work on what's called supplemental essays, which is, um, essays that are school specific. So sometimes they'll ask like, what is a diverse perspective that you bring? Um, or what is something that you want, that you've seen and you want to continue studying when you get to law school? Um, I don't know, like things like that. So you write all of these essays and then one by one you submit your applications around, they open in September, I submitted mine in November, or December, and then you basically wait for like three or four months to start hearing back. Um, and then you decide where to go. And a lot of people, like if you're living in the US, you'll go visit these schools and there's like admitted students days and this and that. Um, but I don't have that luxury because I'm not gonna fly back to America to <laughs> visit a school. Um, and so I've been talking to a lot of alumni, like what was it like studying there? Um, did you like living there? Like what, even what's the weather like? Um, what job opportunities do you have graduating? And like basically interviewing people just like this to get a feel of the school as much as I can. That's something I interesting I noticed between the difference I noticed between 
local universities here and universities abroad. I mean, the yeah. admission process. So here, the way it works basically is you show up and do a test and you get selected based on your results. Mm. Uh, with foreign universities, on the other hand, you have to go through all these different stages where you write essays and sit interviews and you get... The, they, they basically have to build a portfolio of who you are and yes. present it to them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Wait, so explain to me the process here. So you take one exam yeah. and you submit it everywhere and then like one school chooses you? Yeah, yeah, that's that's more like it. So oh. the, the way it works here essentially is you have to do five tests on different subjects. Mm. So, so one on math, one on um, English and one on history, one on literature so all these different subjects and you get picked based on your score so, so even, there, there are no essays there are no interviews oh interesting yeah. so even if you are pursuing like medicine mm -hmm. you still have to take history and literature and english the last i checked yes oh interesting yeah oh, which is so mind-boggling yeah i think our, i mean our sat is like that like the mm -hmm. sat is there's a reading section mm -hmm. a math section a grammar mm -hmm. and a science and the a I think and the ACT is the same so it is kind of similar that they do test you on all of mm -hmm. your subjects but they do care about who you are as a person mm -hmm. because these schools are so selective they can't just take everyone with high scores they want to make sure that yes you have the aptitude like mm -hmm. you have the intelligence or whatever to go to the school but they also want like someone with a good personality and somebody who's going to like graduate and be good for that school's name going forward so um it's a lot more personalized and then also you get to choose what school you go to like i could apply to somewhere in montana which is like a random literally random state in in the u.s and be selected to go to that school but at the end of the day i don't really want to go to school in montana even if they accepted me so like there's more of a choice in where you want to go there's a lot more choice in the education system in the U.S. in general compared to the education system here. And it's not a it's not bad, but it's just really different. And that's something I noticed when I started teaching here. Yeah, which is something I'd like to talk more about in later chapters of the podcast today. Local education and foreign education strengths and weaknesses. But before we get to that, can we talk a little more about studying law in general? So how does it compare to other disciplines like say science math it, is it difficult is it is, because to a lot of people out there law is rocket science yeah it's like it's super hard <laughs> it is pretty difficult they say that law school is like it's not fun <laughs> i don't think it's supposed to be very fun it's very difficult it's a lot of i think one thing that sets it apart from other disciplines is that it's a lot of reading like a ton of reading you're reading constantly you're reading about the history of certain laws. You're reading about why the government ruled a certain way in 1935 and then changed their opinion in 1970. And you're learning how to read the law, how to find loopholes in contracts, how to like um, format a contract. It's very detail oriented. Like a period in the wrong place is like, I don't know, you could get fired. Like it's, I mean, not that dramatic, but honestly it's that high stress. And it's, so it's very different in that sense. Very reading heavy. My sister is in um, medical school. She just graduated medical school actually. And it's less heavy reading and more like conceptual understanding. Like she does more hands-on like understanding the human body and oh if a person has like yellow eyes and yellow skin and a liver infection like what does that mean and like applying scientific principles to the human body so it's just like completely different ways of thinking i think and but to answer your initial question yeah it's very difficult i wouldn't say it's easy so there is a lot of abstraction in law Yes. And also that also depends on what school you go to. So some law schools are not heavy on abstraction. They'll teach you the law. They'll teach you what you need to know. And this is what happened and this is what didn't happen. And this is why it happened that way. But at other schools, namely Yale, 
um, is known for a more like abstract approach to the law. So they're like teaching you like, how should we think about this? And in the future, how might this change? And how does current politics affect how people see this law? And how does the government structure affect how we read the law? And like this, honestly, I haven't been to Yale yet, but that's what they're known for is like a more philosophical understanding of, of like they're teaching you how to think and not what to think about. Yeah. And I guess there's also some fun part to studying law because um, I actually did study law for one semester back in university. It was commercial law and we did something called the mood trial. Uh-huh. We yeah. used to do something called mood trial. It's basically role play. You get to be a lawyer. Yes. And so do you do something like that? Yes, I did. So all four years of undergrad, mm-hmm. I did mock trial which is you get a case and it's a really interesting case, but um, they give you like a bunch of witnesses, all of their affidavits, which is their retelling of what happened from their perspective. Um, All the laws and court cases that you can use and reference during your case. There's a, a plaintiff, which is like the person pursuing a case. And then there's the defense or prosecution and defense, depending on if it's a criminal or civil case, whatever. And everyone has a role. So I was an attorney. So I would be like asking the witness questions, um, cross-examining witnesses, giving speeches, like trying to convince the jury to rule in favor of the plaintiff. And it's super interesting because you become so articulate in your public speaking. You become so like quick on your feet. Like, oh, if this ruling doesn't work and if this objection doesn't work, then this objection. And if this one doesn't work, then this objection. And um, it's very dynamic. And that's like one of the biggest reasons that I was committed to going to law school because I enjoyed that whole, like that, that way of thinking. It's so creative and it's so like critical. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I can already tell you're very articulate. Like if we <laughs> were you. to go against each other, <laughs> and the, she would probably wipe the floor with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It also depends like what you're talking about. So yeah. I could just be saying a bunch of yeah. nonsense and I see. that matters too. Yeah. And speaking of law, would you like to run for president one day? Oh my God, No. Literally, no. (laughs) Every time I tell my friends and family that like, oh, I'm going to law school or like they like hear me speak, they're like, oh, you're our next president. Like, absolutely not. I would never do that job. I do not want to be in the public eye. And like the president of the United States specifically is such a like heavily criticized role. Like everybody hates you all the time for four years. Polarizing figure. Yeah, exactly. Or eight years. And I just don't want to be hated for four to eight (laughs) years, honestly. And it's like so much pressure. If you see pictures of like a president at the beginning of their term, they're like Mm -hmm. super happy and young and like bright. And they're like, I could change the world. And like eight years later, they're like graying and like Mm -hmm. wrinkles and they look so tired because they are. And they're working all day, so much pressure. Um, and honestly, like right now, the United States does not have as like strong of a presence as it once did. And it's not like as respected of a country in my opinion. And I think the opinion of our allies around the world, is just not like as respected as it once was. And Mm so maybe I should want to be president to like change that, but I just don't think that role is for me. It's too public. So imagine you're the president, you get to be the president for four years, and what are some policy changes you'd make? (sighs) There's so many things. The things that I would want to change Mm -hmm. are like gun violence needs to go down. That's probably like the first thing that I would want to work on. And I think that the media makes it seem like people don't agree on gun control. But at the end of the day, I think most people in America can agree that like we shouldn't have mass shootings and like kids shouldn't be afraid to go to school um, or like to a concert or whatever it is. So I think that would be like my first measure in terms of specific like policy changes. Um, Another like policy change that I think is really important that America is like gray on right now is healthcare. So most people in America pay for private health care or they have health insurance because it's like provided by their company, but you're still like paying into it, like through your paycheck, but old, like really, really old people and very, very poor people don't have proper access to health care. So like, that's something else that I would change. Like they should have like a public safety net maybe. And you can choose if you have enough money to pay for private health care, 
you go for it. Pay for private health care. It's probably shorter lines. It's probably better quality. But if you don't have money for that, then you should have an option to wait four hours but eventually be seen by somebody. So I think that that's another thing. America's just so big and there's so many different opinions. It's part of what makes America great but also what is like a weakness. There's so much diversity that we, it's hard to agree on anything. And so if that's the main problem in America, that we can't agree on anything, then we should make it so that everything is a choice. Like, you can have a choice to whatever kind of healthcare you want. You should have a choice of what state you live in. You should have a choice of like something that's in the news now consistently is like whether or not abortion should be legalized. You should have a choice in whether you or not you want that. If you don't want it, then don't get one. If you do, then you should have that option. Like, I don't believe in this whole, like, the government should be telling you what's allowed and what's not allowed. I think there's everything should just be, like, you should have a choice. And people should be able to live the way they want to live, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because the America is such a culturally diverse country, it's so difficult to run it. Yes, yeah. it, it, which is why I would this never is... want to be president. Like it's and and not these. This is what I would say. Like I want to do these things, but mm -hmm. then you have to go through Congress and you have to go through Senate, and then you have to the Supreme Court might say like, oh no, that's not legal, and then you have to pass it down to the states. And there's so many like hoops to jump through to get one thing passed that it's like just frustrating. It's like bureaucratic like nonsense and mm -hmm. it's like really difficult to get anything done which is how any country runs but like when there's such pressing issues in america like gun violence you want to see change happening faster and it just doesn't and i think that would like keep me up at night okay. <laughs> like i yeah. couldn't do it sure uh, let, let's then take a step away from the politics and all that and yeah. talk more about talk a little about culture in the u.s so you are from texas right yes One of the, so what does it feel to be a texan What's, what's life like in Texas? I'm a proud Texan uh -huh. and I'm also a proud American. Like I, I realize that there's problems in America and in Texas, but I'm very proud to be a Texan. Um, I live in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So that is like a, like a city city. Like it's a it's really established city that's like growing. Um, it's really nice. The weather is a lot like Uzbekistan. Everyone always says like, oh, Texas, cowboys, it's really hot. And I'm like, yeah, it's really hot in the summer, but it's the same weather as Uzbekistan in the winter and the fall and the spring. The weather's really nice. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of space between like places. So it's not a walkable city. So there's a lot of driving. Like people are like half, half of our lives were like in our car. Um, I honestly miss driving, <laughs> but um, so that's really nice. The people are very kind. The very hospitable. The food is fantastic in Dallas specifically. Um, and there's a lot to do. Like there's malls and there's parks. There's the downtown area that has like food trucks and like um, art museums and restaurants and cafes and bars and clubs. And then there's concerts. Um, we don't have that much nature, um, but there's like enough. There's like lakes and things, I guess boating and stuff so like I don't know there's just a lot to do I loved growing up in Dallas like I, I I think that it's a great place to grow up I grew up in the suburbs it was so nice I would like ride my bike or like play in the creek or play on the streets with my friends so I don't know I don't have any complaints so what is something you find yourself doing when you're not busy studying or worrying about the world problems <laughs> <laughs> okay I don't spend that much time worrying about global <laughs> issues but um in my free time, I like to hang out with my friends. Like I'm a very social person. So I love trying the new restaurants, like getting dressed up and going with a bunch of my girlfriends and like trying a new restaurant or my sister trying a new restaurant. Um, concerts, mm -hmm. I love concerts. So I'll, I'll do that in my free time. Um, a lot of the time it's just like hanging out at people's houses or like taking walks or mm -hmm. things. It's very similar to like what you're doing anywhere else. But I think the ambiance makes a lot of difference. Like um, like Texas has really, really good restaurants and cafes. So like hanging out at those places is really fun. Um, and going to the movies. I love going to the movies. So that's good. Okay, then now I have two more questions. So okay. you said you're a big fan of concerts, right? Who's yes. your favorite musician? Oh my God, that's so difficult. <laughs> So you would have to pick one and listen to him or her for the rest of your life. Who would that be? Oh my gosh, that's so difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Not a bit. If I have to listen to one person for the rest of my life, maybe it would be Frank Ocean. Frank Ocean, never heard of him. It's like a I'll, chill R and B artist. Uh huh. But um, I have so many like mm -hmm. artists that I like. It's like really difficult to choose. But if I had to choose one, it would be Frank Ocean. Okay. A lot of variety in his music, like. He's like a chill vibe, and yeah, I like him. And you, you also said you're really big on movies. So yes. Uh, what's your most favorite movie of all time? Oh my gosh, you're asking really difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, one. I'm okay. Uh, you can you can actually make it three, not one. Okay, okay. Yeah. My first is a movie called Arrival. Uh huh. I, I know this one. It's so good. Star I love that Amy movie. Adams. Yes, with Amy Adams. I love that movie. Another one I really like, it's an indie, it's a Bollywood movie. Mm -hmm. It's called Ye Jivani Hey Divani. It's like really long, but it's really good. And then a third movie I like is, um, I really like the the series, the Now You See Me series. It's like a movie about magic. Yeah, yeah I've, I've watched it. But it's like a heist. Yeah. I think it's really, really interesting. I don't know. I don't know if these are actually my favorite, but these are movies that I really, really enjoy watching. And if I could add a fourth, Interstellar is amazing. I also love that movie. Uh, are you into comic book movies? Do you like comic book movies? Like, what do you mean? Like Marvel movies? Oh, yeah. Marvel, I DC. I love Marvel movies, yes. <laughs> I guess that's, yeah, those are comic books. I hate, I don't really like DC comic movies. I don't think they'd make them as well. Um, but Batman was good. But um, uh, uh, which one is your favorite Batman? Uh, is is it the new one? Dark Knight, probably no, not uh -huh. the new one. With with what's his name? Robert Pattinson. Yeah, no, that, definitely not. I thought that one was like, I, I thought it was so corny. I yeah. don't know. I didn't like it. I, I didn't like actually. I don't like it either because he's so skinny. <laughs> and he was didn't yeah, fit the role. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and the Batman in the comics is really buff. He's big. Yeah. He's scary looking. Yeah. And he's he doesn't look scary. <laughs> I just didn't like the writing. Like I didn't think it was a good. Yeah. Story. I don't know. Um, but yeah, The Dark Knight. Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, my, my favorite one is uh, the, the one starring Ben Affleck. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he is so comic book accurate. He, he is. Looks, yeah. Yeah. And his voice <laughs> just gives me chills. So do you like the Marvel mm -hmm. movies too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My favorite Marvel, Marvel character is Wolverine. Hugh so Jackman. Like Wolverine? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Hugh Jackman. Yeah, nice. I grew up watching all his movies, and I'm really glad he's gonna be back for another one. Yeah, with Deadpool. Yeah, that yeah. one is uh, that one's gonna be a dope mashup. Yeah, I like the Deadpool movies; those <laughs> are really good too. I lean toward Marvel sides. Like, I really like Captain America and like mm -hmm. Iron Man, Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. But um, <coughs> I think Marvel has started to decline a little bit. <laughs> I don't uh, know what why. do you think that happened? I don't know. I think what happened was that during. COVID, they like mm -hmm. stopped producing all the movies. And then right after COVID ended, they like pushed out a ton of movies to try to like get the hype back for mm -hmm. Marvel. But they created so many that the quality went down and they were mo more focused on quantity. And I think they should have just spaced it out and like let people want mm -hmm. to watch Marvel movies instead of like throwing, like what was yeah. Eternals? Like I didn't even watch that, but like, <laughs> yeah. why did they, like it was so unnecessary. I didn't think yeah. they needed to do that or like, they just they just put out too many and the quality went down. I think. And do you think it has also to do little with the fact that now they are they have this woke ideas? Woke. They got things like feminism and. I think that there's a way to make those themes like look good and make a difference in movies. Like the Barbie movie, mm -hmm. for example, was huge in the U.S. And I think that they made feminism so front and center that it was actually good. But when you put like, when you do like an idea like feminism or like, I don't know, gender inequality or whatever it is, and you like try to make it subtle, sometimes it can get like, it can lose the like appeal and it could just be like really forced. It can feel forced. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know if that's necessarily why the Marvel movies are not as like good mm -hmm. anymore, but um, there's a way to make those ideas impactful and a way to make them like not impactful. And plus, I feel like uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe died with Tony Stark. Yes. Yeah. His That's death huge... was so moving. Yes. Yeah. And that was tragic. like the end of an era. Yeah. Right. And then they started making like these Spider Man movies and this and that, which are also good. Like Tom Holland's 
fine, but it's not the same. Just fine. <laughs> he's fine. I don't know. He's not my favorite Spider-Man. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's an old era, uh -huh. and I prefer the old era. I feel like as I get older, I'm like, oh, I prefer the classics. It's mm -hmm. like, are the old Marvel movies really classics? No, but they will be at some point, and I'll be like, when they made movies when I was young, they used to be so good. Like, I don't know. Americans always, as they get older, they uh, like, like Fun the fact, old. Avengers Infinity War was made about six years ago. Oh, really? It's been six years. Can you believe that? How old would I have been? Like 17? Honestly, yeah, yeah. I can believe that because I was in high school when it came yeah. out. And I, I loved it. I loved that whole trilogy. It was like fantastic. And it was yeah. such a good like movie experience to watch in the cinema. That's one. Th I haven't been to the cinema here. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's very similar. But like going to the cinema in the US, it's like you are transported in this other world. And then you like walk outside and it's daylight and you're mm -hmm. like, oh my God. This just like ruined the vibe. But I love going to the cinema in the US. Uh, what's one scene from Avengers movies that give you goosebumps every time you watch it? The scene where, this is such a like cliche answer, but the scene where Captain America like catches the hammer, Thor's that, hammer. That's, that's what I had in mind. That's like, I think that's like <laughs> the most cliche answer, but it really was like incredible. It was such a good, and... Captain America is my personal favorite. And like, of course you know that. Of course he's worthy of being able to hold the hammer. But a really funny scene that I like is when the hammer's like on the table and they all try to mm -hmm. lift it. Yeah. And then it goes to that port and you're like, wow, that was so good. So full circle. It was mind blowing because I remember watching it at theater and the entire audience yeah, exactly. went crazy. Yeah. So did that, did Avengers <laughs> show here, mm -hmm. like in the cinemas here? Yeah, in Russian. In Russia. In Russia. Okay. In Russian. In Russian. Russian. In Russian, oh, Russian not in Russia. In Russian, though. Do you feel like when uh, they dub movies mm -hmm. in Russian or like in Uzbek or whatever, that it loses some of the... Oh, for sure. Really? That 100%. Okay. It's a whole different experience watching movie in its original language. Yes. So, yeah. Definitely. I, I actually stopped wa watching in Russians after Avengers m movie. I'm like, okay, I have to watch it in English. Yeah. It's just a whole different feel. Well, and you would understand the whole thing in English, uh -huh. so like, why not watch yeah. it in English? Yeah. yeah. I, I only watched that theater because I couldn't wait until the, the digital release. Yeah. Yeah, because it would be another three months of w right. waiting, and yeah, uh, and yeah, you want to see it in the cinema, like it's such a big yeah big moment. But yeah, I wish there were more English cinemas here, like theaters showing movies in English. But uh, unfortunately, though, most people can't speak English, so. It's not simply profitable here. Yeah. To but show. can't you like rent out theaters mm -hmm. and like put a movie on? In yeah, English? I guess so. But unless you're Bruce Wayne, you're not going to be able to afford that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. Uh, how about culture in Uzbekistan? How do you like it here? I like it here a lot. Um, uh -huh. Actually, yesterday I was at an iftar mm -hmm. celebration at one of my co-teachers. And like everyone is so kind, so hospitable. They like want you to be part of their culture. I was on a train to Fergana Valley the other day and um, the train left at like six. And so everyone's waiting, waiting. And that 6.30 is like iftar. And I'm sitting at one of those booths that's like a table and there's mm -hmm. two chairs mm -hmm. on, each, on each side. And this is a family of three, like a really like old, really sweet people. And they unpack their whole feast. I'm just like reading my book or whatever, mm -hmm. listening to music. And they're like, you have to eat with us. Like, please eat. Mm -hmm. Like offering me bread and dates and like meat and whatever they had. And it was like, they didn't even think twice about, oh, this person should join us for this meal. And so that's really nice. Another thing that I really like about Uzbekistan is that's really safe. Like, I don't feel like I'm going to be like, I don't know, something bad is going to happen. Like if getting I'm, mugged. Yeah, in the like street. getting mugged or like stabbed or like mm -hmm. I don't know, kidnapped or something worse. I'm not like super afraid of that all the time. I'm still very cautious, probably because I grew up in the US, but um, it's really safe here and I can like trust people more. Like if I were to leave my phone and wallet and like purse somewhere and like forget it there and come back, it would like the shop owner would be like, oh yeah, you left your purse here yesterday. You're so silly. Here, here you go. Mm -hmm. In America, like it would be gone. <laughs> it's <laughs> not there when you go back. And so the tr the level of trust and like the sense of community, I really like here. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I really like I really like Uzbekistan. It's very different, mm -hmm. but it's great. I mean, and how about food? How do you like food here? 
The food is good. So I'm vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, and like, obviously a lot of the food is meat based. I still try everything. Um, like shashlik is great. Somsas are great. I like lagman personally. Um, the food is really good. It's a little oily than for what I'm used to, but it doesn't take away from the flavor. Like it's really, really good. Um, like I'll go out and get national food because I like crave national food. The soup is so good here. Salads. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I like it. It's good. So what's your favorite dish so far? What's number one on your list? I would, I, I used to always say lagman, mm -hmm. but now I've had like really good plov. <laughs> so it, it has to be plov. Um, Bukharan plov is not my favorite. I think my favorite might be Samarkand plov. Um, but I love plov. And every time I ask my students like, oh, what's your favorite food? All of their answer is plov. Like none of them <laughs> say anything else. I'm like, guys, there's so much more good food here. And they're like, but plov is so good. So yeah, I like plov a lot. Oh, okay. And how about the infrastructure in the city? How do you like it? Do you think, would you say it's easy to get around? It's easy to get around. Mm -hmm. But the like quality of the roads isn't great. That's oh. not even the problem. My my issue is actually that it's not walkable. Like there's not good sidewalk infrastructure, and that's like specific to Bukhara. Like in Tashkent and like Fergana and Samarkand to some extent, there's like sidewalks, but there's no mm -hmm. sidewalks here, which is like really interesting. And they warned me about. It. They were like, bring shoes that you're not afraid to like get ripped up because. There's no sidewalks here. And also there's like random holes in the ground sometimes, like like ma those manholes <laughs> that I'm yeah. just like, whoa, like I definitely could have <laughs> fallen into that and it would have been really bad. So maybe that needs a little bit of fixing, but other than that, like it's fine. And it's, I really hope city planners watching this podcast are taking note <laughs> right now. Please fix the holes. Like, they're so dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. they are. Yes, they are. Yeah, I'm really glad you like, you like it here. Well, would you like to stay here longer? Would you like to stay here for another year? So... I really miss my friends and family, uh -huh. but if all my friends and family were here, I wouldn't mind staying here. I don't know if I would stay in Bukhara specifically, like maybe I would try Fergana or Tashkent or something. Because of the sidewalks. Because of the sidewalks, <laughs> please. Um, uh, no, because I think that there's more like a little bit more nightlife, a little bit more, and it's more walkable. And mm -hmm. I prefer like a walkable city, so that's why I would probably move there. But what really makes you miss a place is not the place it's always like the people that are there so like i really miss my friends my family my dog so that's why i would really want to go back um and also i want to continue my education so i would like go back for that oh yeah yeah you're going to yell this semester <laughs> yeah it's like i gotta go back <laughs> i technically i could have deferred i think for like another year mm -hmm. but um yeah i like i miss home so i would probably go back yeah yeah sure and yeah, we talked a lot about culture. Now, what do you say we go back to education? Uh -huh. Yeah, I would, since you're involved in teaching, I'd like to ask you a little about your teaching approach. Yeah. So you're currently teaching English at university, right? Yes, yes. So how do you go about the teaching process? What are some do's and don'ts you have? It's changed a lot since I first got here. When I first got here, I was doing like lecture-based lessons um, so I would like put a bunch of text on the screen and highlight words that they don't know and then have my students like read about whatever concept we were talking about and like teach them in that way. Now I've started doing more interactive lessons. Like let's write, like if we're learning about myths, for example, that was like one of our most recent lessons, then we'll write a myth together. So it like kind of gets them like a little bit more creative, gets them thinking, gets them involved. We play a lot more games now, like on Kahoot or like Scategories we played the other day. Um, because I think something that is lacking a little bit in the education here that I've seen is like students aren't very involved. Like they just are like sitting and being lectured at. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed is that every lesson I like teach about a different topic. So like we've done sports, we've done Thanksgiving, when it was like Thanksgiving time. We've done um, the Errol Sea, like what happened to the Errol Sea in English, because they know what happened in Uzbek, but like learning these words in English. Um, the fashion industry and fast fashion, climate change, 
um, I don't know, like different topics that I want my students to be thinking about, but give them words in English to be thinking about them in. I think that's been like an effective approach. Um, it's definitely really hard to teach English though. Like, I don't know if that's just me. <laughs> I, you, you must be a much better teacher because your students have like learned in like nine months, but it's difficult for me to teach English. Uh, well, with me, the way it works is I, well, when they come to me, they usually come with uh, actually some understanding, some prior knowledge of English. So what, what we do here is we help them go from intermediate level to advanced. And then from advanced to native, like then obviously they're going to need help of people like you. So to go from intermediate to advanced, we get them basically to learn a text or a dialogue mm -hmm. and, and get them to repeat it out loud, vocalize their answers. So rather than teach them grammar and vocabulary separate, we just give them a ready text mm. and get them to learn it. So this way you don't have to worry about their grammar, their vocabulary. Because I know when I do teach them grammar and vocabulary, they're not going to be able to mix it match, ma mix it, match, right. match it well. Yeah. So this is what we call here a contextualized learning approach. So I think that that's yeah. like a really effective method. And when I think about it, that is how I learned Arabic. It's so like we would have all the vocab words mm -hmm. and then we would have like, like let's say the lesson is ordering at a restaurant. So we'd have all these words like chai and menu and mm -hmm. like spoon, fork, water, sugar, coffee, whatever. And then they would give us a dialogue of somebody ordering at a restaurant and the waiter and somebody would play a waiter and somebody would play the person ordering and they would practice that dialogue. So I've tried to do that a mm -hmm. little bit. I should probably do it more. Yeah. Um, because I do think that's like probably the most effective way. Uh, but the one downside of this approach is it's so boring. Because, yes, because exactly. it, it is so boring. Yeah. So you have to be extremely disciplined, you know, keep to keep doing it again and again and again. Yeah. Because uh, more often than not, what I see students do, they simply struggle to retrieve the words from their memory and be able to, you know, say them in that exact order they appear in the text, yeah. which is the whole challenge. Yeah. And you have to have a lot of like mental strength just to sit yeah. through and practice it nonstop until you get it right. Yeah, I think that's something that helps that is like partnering my students mm -hmm. and then being like, you will play, mm -hmm. let's say the waiter and you will play the customer. Mm -hmm. And they're each in partners. So it's not like as boring, but it's not as like... I don't know. It's not as stimulating for sure, which is mm -hmm. why I do it less, but it is the most effective. So maybe I should go back to doing that. I don't know. It's very trial and error, <laughs> my teaching, because I want them to be like excited to learn English and excited to learn about the topic, but I also want them to be able to speak. So it's hard to balance those things. Yeah. And I remember you telling me you can speak five languages, right? I can speak five languages poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a jack That's, of all trades, master of yeah. none. Well, I can speak English pretty well, but mm -hmm. um, yes, I can speak Arabic. I studied Arabic in undergrad, Hindi, Gujarati, which is like a kind of like a offshoot of Hindi, mm -hmm. um, Spanish, and English. Spanish only because I lived in Texas. So like, it's not like business Spanish. It's like operational Spanish or like, um, what is the word? Colloquial Spanish. Like, oh, like very simple phrases. Mm -hmm. So as someone who's learned several different languages, uh, what would you say is the most optimal approach to learning another language? If they're learning all these languages at the same time? No, or if say, say I'm a language learner, I want to learn French. Mm -hmm. So how should I go about it? Should I start with the, uh, clearly I'm going to start with the alphabet and then simple words, right? Yeah, I would start with the alphabet and then I would start with like, um, the most common phrases mm -hmm. like, hello, how mm -hmm. are you? My name is Safi. I'm from Dallas. I went to school in blah, blah, blah. And like those phrases learn first because th that teaches you the sentence structure. Like the one thing that I've noticed is the students that I have in my class that can speak Russian grasp English much faster because like, if you say I am here in mm -hmm. English, the sentence structure is the same in Russian, which is like, yeah, is this or whatever. Right. Yes. So I'm like, I don't even know Russian that well. Um, no, that was actually correct. You know, what's surprising <laughs> is you speak Russian better than I do. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Definitely I don't. Um, but so like the sentence structure there is the same. Whereas if you say mm -hmm. that same sentence in Uzbek, it's oh, like flipped that, 
that I don't even would, know it. That it's, would be a mess. That yeah. would be such a big mess. Exactly. And like yeah. questions, for example, like if you say, how are you mm -hmm. in English? And then you say like kandaises, I mm -hmm. guess that's similar. Yeah. But most of them aren't. Most of them aren't similar sentence structure. So that's like really difficult. Also something that's so hard mm -hmm. is the stuff that's like, um, I like, okay, if you say I am here, the am, they always forget the am. Or like I'm going to Korzinka, they forget the to. Because in Russian and in Uzbek, you don't need those like stupid connector words. But in English, that's like everything is like those stupid little connector words. That's mm -hmm. really difficult. And for this exact reason, we just get them to memorize it word for word, verbatim. Yeah. And they sometimes hate me for that, but... But it helps. I, I feel like it's a necessary evil. Yeah. Like, that they may not understand it now, but they'll. I'm sure they'll thank me later on. Yeah, the way I see it is, it's like uh, taking up math. Like, starting out, you have to learn the multiplication table. Yeah. And the way you do that is by memorizing it. Yeah. And only later on do you realize why 2 multiplied 3 equals 6. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Okay, so as someone who's been involved in teaching here in Uzbekistan for some time, objectively speaking, what are some strengths and weaknesses of our education? A strength mm -hmm. is that they, like this country, mm -hmm. has made it so that you need to be educated. And that is like something that's very underrated because um, if there's no like need for education, there's no incentive to be educated. This is kind of a downside as well, but like you need a bachelor's to make a certain amount of money and then you need a master's to make a certain amount of money. And then if you have a PhD, then you could be making like millions of Zoom, like, and it goes up by level. So like equating education to the amount of money you make is a strength of the system. Something that I think is like maybe a weakness is that there's very little independence in the education system in general. And that's not because of the education. It's because of like the culture. So you go to school in kindergarten and then you go to like first grade through 12th grade or however many grades you have. And then you go to bachelor's and then you go to master's. And all throughout this, you never live alone. You're never living alone or like with your friend. You're always like living with your parents or your husband or your children or your in-laws or like somebody. And I think independence is like really important in education because you like learn to do things yourself and you learn about yourself. Like, what do I like to do? What do I not like to do? How do I cook and clean? How do I do my laundry? Um, how do I manage my time? Like things like that. No one's telling you what to do. And then also independence in terms of like, let's say I want to study medicine. So I'm like, okay, I go to med school. But then all of my classes are chosen for me. But I want to take like French and take medicine and learn about history. And I should be able to choose what electives I want to take. Like if I don't want to learn English, then I shouldn't be like sitting in an English class and like wasting my time and the teacher's time. So it's like that selection is not there and that independence isn't there. And I think it's maybe not a weakness, but it's like really it's very different than how the U.S. system works. So can you imagine your life, do you imagine what your life would be like if you never left home, if you lived your entire life with your parents? It would be really different. And, and yeah. like, that still happens in the U.S. Like, there are a lot of people who commute from home and do their bachelors as, like, commuters. So they live at home and then they, like, drive to school and go home every day. But after that, you're definitely living on your own. Like, the maximum that someone's like really living at home with their parents is like 23, 24, 25. After that, like you should probably get your own place or like, I don't know, get married and like buy a house or something. I don't know. But like you move out eventually. If I had never left home, I think that I just wouldn't know who like I was as much. And also there's so much that comes with living at home. Like family dynamics <laughs> like sometimes it can be really stressful sometimes it can be very hard sometimes there's no privacy there's sometimes there's no choice like my mom will make whatever my dad wants to eat but like what if I want to have like a taco I don't know or like something it's just like there's 
I would feel like so much less free to do what I wanted. Like at eight o'clock, what if I want to go take a walk or go to the gym? My mom would be like, no, you're not going to the gym. It's dark outside. But like if I was at university and I'm living alone, I'm going to go to the gym whenever I want. You know, it's like little things like that, but it really makes you feel like, okay, I have like choice in my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't agree more. Actually, my experience in the U.S., uh, back in 2019 taught me a lot, helped me mature into the guy I am today. I don't think I'd, I'd, I would have built confidence. I don't think I would have reached the level of maturity I have now yeah. if I had not gone to the U.S. alone. Yeah, in fact, I was given options to choose from. I could either go there with my friends or alone. I picked alone. That's option. good, yeah. Yeah, and, and looking back, I think it was by far the best decision I'd ever made. And it makes yeah. so much sense. Like, it's really hard to develop yourself if you're never alone. Mm -hmm. and, like, people here are rarely alone, especially like women. Mm -hmm. They're rare. They're rarely alone. They're they either have like a child in their hands, or mm -hmm. they like have a husband, or they're with their mother-in-law or their father-in-law, or like their friends. It's like. Don't you want to be alone sometimes? And when they are alone, it's like they're scrolling on social media. But it's yeah. like that's not the same, you know? It's like you're always being stimulated. You should just like be at peace. It's just you're deprived of chances to for self-discovery. Exactly, you, yeah. You don't get to, like you said, you don't get to explore who you are. You don't know who yeah. you are. Your preferences and your likes. You just yeah. like what other people like. Exactly. Yeah. But it's also like not people's fault because mm -hmm. in order to do that, you have to leave home. Mm -hmm. And it's really expensive to leave home here. Yeah. And the salaries here are like deplorably low. Like it's not enough to live on, you know, and to move somewhere else or to even like to move to Tashkent or something. It's so expensive. So it's like I can't I can't like expect people to have that want to go somewhere if it's impossible to do that, you know? Yeah. And also, plus, our parents are just worried that we're going to get lost or something bad is going to happen. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's... Like, you'll, like, drink yeah. cold water mm -hmm. when it's cold outside or something. <laughs> it's like, okay, let them drink the cold water. They'll it's just, figure it out. It's this whole concept of helicopter parenting is so prevalent here yeah. in our country. And a lot of it is because of our mentality. And But, but I think it's starting to change because I know a lot of my peers and... Uh, younger generation, their parents actually encouraged them to go abroad, to move to another city for their education. So, yeah. I think it is changing too. It, like a lot of my students in my class actually do live alone mm -hmm. because they're not from Bukhara city. They're mm -hmm. from like a surrounding area. Um, so they live alone and I can see that they are so much more like independent and capable because they live alone. Um, and I, I, I can see it so much clearer in the men. Like, there was one student in my class last semester and we were talking about like how like little boys don't even know where the kitchen is or something. I don't know. We like made some joke. That's not true, but, but like whatever. And he was like, I know where the kitchen is. Like I cook every day. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, I live alone. And I was mm -hmm. like, there, well, there you go. Like no yeah. wonder you can cook and clean for yourself because you live alone. And that's like huge. And then when he gets married one day, he's not going to have to rely on the person he's married to or like his in-laws. So he'll just be like, well, if I'm hungry, I'm going to make something, you know? Right, right. But like Uzbekistan is such a young country. Like it was started in what, 1991, it gained independence. Yeah. It's less than 30 years old. Like even a person that's th like less than 30 years old, how can you expect them to figure this all out? Like given a country, like, it's going to take time. It's really going to take time. And it's moving in the right direction. So, I mean, all you can do is, like, give it more time. And uh, speaking of what to expect from, like, people, you said that the guy who lives alone, he is going to make a good husband in the future, right? So what's your... What, might be, yeah. yeah. What's your perception of an ideal man? <laughs> How would you define an ideal man? Um... I think the ideal man is someone who is like in tune with themselves and their emotions and also in tune with the needs of their like family and like wife. They should also be like someone who's independent, but family oriented. Like, so, so 
these are polar opposites. Exactly. And it's hard to find the balance. There, it is. Strike a balance between the two. Like you can't really have it both ways. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. But like what I mean by like independent but family oriented is that like they want to take care of their family mm -hmm. and take care of themselves and they're capable of doing that. But they're also, you know, like if I were to go on like a business trip for like a week or something, like they would, I, I, they should be competent enough to like take care of my kids or like take care of themselves. Let's say I don't have kids, like take care of themselves. And um, also just being like a kind and compassionate person. Like it's not even that it makes them the ideal husband. It's just like, this is what it is to be a good human being. Like be nice, be kind, like take note of little things like little needs that your wife needs or that your kids needs that you need and be able to communicate those things property properly like if you need space for i don't know a couple hours because you're like everything is really overwhelming me then use your words and say that and take space like that's what it means to be independent but also be like compassionate and family oriented you know got it I'm taking notes in my head right now. <laughs> like, okay, so, yeah, yes, got I it. so you need to be in control of your emotions. This is number one. Uh -huh. Number two, you have to be independent, family oriented, and you have to be extremely kind to people around. Yes. Got it. And how about uh, your perception of an ideal woman? Same thing. Yeah. It, like literally the same thing. Compassionate, kind, in control of their emotions, family oriented and independent. Like, it's just being a good person, you know, like it doesn't matter if you're a man, a woman, a in between, a dog, a cat, like, I don't know, be nice and, yeah. and know what you want and ask for it in a kind way. Yeah, that's such an interesting perspective. And, and I can't agree more. Like, I think it's very important that people are mature and that they look out for each other and that they're kind and compassionate. Yeah, yeah these are some qualities I would look for in a good partner. Now, what do you say we talk a little about stress and setbacks. I have another chapter dedicated to stress and setback because I know as a law student as and I'm someone living in a foreign country, mm -hmm. you over you come across a lot of setbacks. So, what's your coping mechanism when dealing with setbacks? Um I let me think. Let me like put myself Sure. Take your time. <laughs> when I first got here and like some setbacks. To be honest, I get very in my head at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Oh, that happens to me a lot. Like I get lost in my head. Exactly. Just, just like because you think about it and you over, think about it. Overthinking. And you, just, or you're like, oh, I could have done this better. And like, this is really difficult for me. And I'm really stressed. And it's this, like that. a vicious circle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then to cope with that, I will journal mm -hmm. sometimes and like get my thoughts out on paper. Usually when I journal it, it's like, okay, this isn't as big of a deal as I'm making it. Um, or I talk to my friends about it. Like I'm, I'm a very vocal person and like a very social person. So I need to like put my words out either mm -hmm. on paper or to someone else. So you don't bottle up. So I don't bottle it up. Yeah. I used to bottle things up a lot. Mm -hmm. And then like in two years after all these things have bottled up, I'd like have a breakdown. That's like so unhealthy. I don't do that <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like I'll talk it through with somebody that I like trust and then like, something that really helps me is like getting sunshine, like taking a walk outside, like opening my windows. Like when you realize that like the world is not just me and my own head and you're like, okay, there's a world outside and like this doesn't actually matter that much, that like really makes me feel better. It's like, it really doesn't matter that much. It's one bad day or it's one setback. It's one like stressful event, but like time moves on. The world doesn't stop. And, and and getting enough sunlight is so relatable because it always reminds me of that scene from Superman, Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a part where he he gets really badly hurt and he and he draws energy from the sun and he just extends his arm like this yeah. and then literally soaking in the energy. Yeah. And this is something I find myself doing sometimes when I'm just having a big a headache just go outdoors and get some sunlight and yeah. it just does the trick it seriously does like yeah. nature is really healing one thing that i noticed by the way i literally have a sun tattoo like on my shoulder right here so <laughs> i really love the sun um but one thing that i noticed since being here this is a double landlocked country right and i never thought about how much i like needed to see greenery until i like lived here 
And I was like, oh my God, there's like no greenery here. Like it's like all sandy colored, like, I don't know, shrubbery. And I really miss being in nature because nature does calm you down. It makes you feel so much more like grounded with the world. And you don't get so like caught up in like the stress of city life mm-hmm. and like this, that. Not that this is like a city, city life, but like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's another reason why I kind of want to go back to America, like just to like see water and like see greenery and like ground myself again. That's really important for me. I remember first time I saw the ocean, I saw the ocean when I was in the US, it was, it was mind blowing. Really? Like imagine someone from this city going there and actually I didn't exactly see it. It was at night. Uh-huh. So when I got to the island I was supposed to be staying on, I it was nighttime and I told my roommates, well, what do you guys say we go out? And he's like, it's dark. Where are you going to go? Let's go and see the ocean. And it was so stupid of me to do that because it was completely dark. <laughs> we couldn't black, see anything, yeah. any, anything. Yes, pitch black. You're right. And all I could hear was the sound of the ocean. It was so scary. Yeah. It was as if a, a giant spaceship was about to crush you. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I felt. It's, it is really scary. But yeah. that's like, that's crazy to me. The first time you saw the, I mean, it makes sense because uh-huh. like we're in Uzbekistan, but the first time you saw the ocean, you had to go all the way to America to like oh, yeah. see the ocean to, or hear the ocean. <laughs> um, but you were in the Outer Banks, right? Yeah. So yeah. you probably saw a ton of water mm-hmm. in general. That must have been really interesting, like coming from Bukhara. Yeah, it was. It was like if, and people ask me like, "Where are you gonna go next?" And like, I'd go back there again. I really miss that place. Yeah, yeah. I really, really want to see the ocean one more time. So now we did talk about stress and setbacks, and we did talk about this as well. Do you have any other personal pursuits outside spending time in nature or? hanging out with your friends, things like reading, writing. Do you like listening to podcasts? I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts all the time. Um, I listen to podcasts more than I like listen to music. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I listen to like a lot of, I listen to NPR. Mm-hmm. This, that's like the daily world report, like what's going on. I listen to the Wall Street Journal, which is like um, interesting, like things happening in America and they like do a deep dive on it. Like the United States is banning TikTok or like they've just passed a bill to ban TikTok. So it like talks about that or um, Trump is in the courts. So they're talking about like, can he pay the fines? And like, I don't know, interesting things like that. And then I listened to this one podcast about um, testing scientific ideas against like what we think about those concepts. So like I just listened to one about like, what do dreams actually mean? And are they actually important or are we just assigning value to these dreams because they, we want them to be in a, important? Uh, are you talking about Andrew Huberman podcast? No, but I like the Andrew Huberman podcast. Those are also great. Um, he has he talks about some really interesting things. Yeah. And then I also do read a lot. I've read a lot more since being here. Um, read some really, really good books. So, so what kind of books do you like to read? I like reading books that are about like... Um, it's ex- usually set in cities. And it's talking about like corporate issues and problems but there's also like romance involved i like those kind of stories and then i also like books um like historical fictions like i read this one book called the song of achilles which is about the trojan war in like greek mythology and they tell you about like hercules and achilles and all these like larger than life heroes and the gods and goddesses that are in the sky like dictating this war but the whole story is told from the perspective of like achilles friend slash lover who's like another guy which was a really interesting like i usually don't read books about like two male interests or two female interests not that i have anything against it but i just had never read it before and it was so interesting, such an interesting perspective, brings in Greek mythology, brings in history. And I, I really like those kind of historical fiction books too. So you call the Song of Achilles. Yes. Oh, I'm going to add it to my reading list. Yeah. I'll be sure to check it out. Yeah. And do you do any sort of, you did say you like journaling when your feelings get bottled up. Yeah. So it kind of helps. Yeah. yeah. I like writing. Mm-hmm. Not that much, but like, I like writing. I like sketching uh-huh. sometimes. Um Working out, I enjoy. Oh, you do? Yeah. Well, I don't enjoy. La, la, la. We, <laughs> we got to talk about it. We have to talk about it because I'm a bit of a gym rat myself. Okay. So, yeah, I, I love going to the gym. Although I haven't been training as hard as I used to do because of my 
back injury. Oh, okay. So I, I recently slipped a disc in oh. my back. Yeah. Wow, that's painful. And yes, it is. That's uh, really But But I'm tough. right now on recovery, doing rehab exercise with my trainer, and he tells me I'll be back to lifting sometime in May again. Nice. Yeah. Okay, I'm no gym rat, mm -hmm. um, but I like going to the gym when I can. I don't go as much as I should probably. Like I was supposed to go to the gym today, but then I got lazy and like blah, blah, blah. Uh, Where do you go to the gym? I go to the fitness center by Sogdiana. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, I don't know that place. Do you go to Chekhov? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was gonna do the Chekhov mm -hmm. one, but I figured like I probably won't go enough to pay that much mm -hmm. to go to Chekhov. But maybe it would have like made me go more because it's like so nice in there. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're staying here until, but, but you're not staying here until September, well, the good news is they're building their new branch with a swimming pool, an octagon, comes with a big cafeteria. Really? Supplementation. Oh, yeah. World-class gym. Can people, like, mm -hmm. afford going to Chekhov? Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of people do. Really? But, like, but my trainer tells me that the uh, subscription fee is going to be twice as expensive. Like, who's yeah. going to be able to afford that? That's, like, my question. Like, I am, like, from America, and... Uh -huh. I'm just like, I just need a gym. I'm not going to pay that much for a gym. But like, it's it's kind of expensive. It Maybe, is. It yeah. is. Well, uh, I, I hope one day it's going to be affordable. But I think I, I see a lot of people actually from different socioeconomic backgrounds work out at Chekhov. It's not actually as expensive as you think. You pay about $200 for the entire year. Why did, maybe they like knew I was a mm -hmm. foreigner and they mm -hmm. like told me that it would be more. Uh, like how much were they going to charge they you? They were saying that it was like. It also depends on your plan. If you get a morning plan, it costs you only $200, which is the plan I have. So and this is the amount you have to pay for the entire year. But maybe if you, that's what it was. But if you want to get VIP, obviously you're going to have to pay a lot more. Oh my God, I would never pay for VIP. <laughs> um, no, I don't know what they told me. This was like back in October when mm -hmm. I like went, it was like 300 for six months or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But then like the fitness center has everything mm -hmm. I need mm -hmm. and it's like 25,000. So what's your fitness goal like? What's my fitness goal? Yeah. I Are just you... want to be like toned. Uh -huh. I don't need to be like a bodybuilder or anything, but I want to be toned and like not have any like extra like skin or like fat anywhere. I want everything to be like toned. And what I realize, and I've always known this, but it's so hard and I like refuse to believe it, even though I know it's true, is that your physique is way less, has way less to do with what you're doing in the gym and way more to do with your diet. Like if I were to True. just cut sugars for like one to two weeks, I would probably look so much closer to my fitness goal mm -hmm. than if I were to keep the same diet and like go to the gym every day for two years. Yeah. But it's so hard. Yeah. I, I actually had a guy on the podcast and he he's also a bit of a gym rat and he told me it's 80% what you do in the kitchen and 20% what you do at the gym. Yeah. I, I learned it the same way. 80% what you do in the kitchen 10% what you do in the gym, 10% genetics. Uh -huh. That's how I learned it in health class. Yeah. Um, I don't, but it's so hard to change your diet. And I, I eat mm -hmm. pretty healthy, but like it's counting calories and everything. It's like, it's so tedious. It's like, I don't want to do that. Uh, how about your supplementation mix? What do you, what do you take as supplements? I, I just have protein powder. Mm -hmm. Um, I eat a lot of like, cause I don't eat meat. So I mm -hmm. need a lot of protein. I eat a lot of like eggs, chickpeas, lentils, protein powder, um, like, I guess, other sources of mm -hmm. protein like that. Um, but what do you mean by supplements? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Whey protein. Do you take creatine? Whey protein. I don't take creatine. Yeah, but but I think you should. It, like, I don't the know. The gains are crazy. Okay, well, I don't know the, like, advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. of creatine. Like, I haven't done enough research. Uh, well, so, uh, I'm not a credible source, but from what I've read and heard from other people is there are really no downsides to taking creatine. Really? It's a naturally occurring substance in your body. Yeah. As long as you cycle it properly. So you're on protein, uh, sorry, for on creatine for about two months and then you take a break for a month and then you go oh, back. Oh, really? So yeah, there's something called cycling. And so, you've, and you've mm -hmm. seen like way more gains using creatine? Uh, yeah, because it simply helps retain your body, body water. And you it, want to retain body water? I feel like I would. Really it want just to makes you look bigger. 
Oh mm. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do I want to look bigger or do I want to look bigger? And also stronger. It's just, yeah. And also uh, this research says that there are some cognitive benefits as well. It just makes you think faster. It's like, uh, what do you call that? Caffeine. Yes. Yeah. It's like caffeine stimulant. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also taking omega-3 fish oil. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's I, really I should important. have omega-3 here, yeah. and I didn't. Mm-hmm. But it's, like, so good for you. It's, like, your mm-hmm. nails, your hair, like, your yes. skin, everything. And you might want to also take a little bit of collagen, mm-hmm. which is what I do, uh, which which is what I take, and zinc and magnesium. I do take zinc. Mm-hmm. I don't have magnesium here. I don't have collagen here. Mm-hmm. B12, mm-hmm. I also take B12. No, Vitamin C. And like multivitamins, just like normal mm-hmm. multivitamins. That's what I have here. Yeah. But probably change. When I go to the US, like mm. everything's gonna change. I'm gonna be like a supermodel. I'm gonna <laughs> take like all the best vitamins and all the best supplements and I'm gonna cut out sugar yeah. and go to the gym every day and it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> That's yeah. the goal. Yeah. And uh, before we wrap this up, I got three more questions I wanna ask you. Okay. So we have a little bit of a tradition here. Okay. So we finish off all our podcasts with. Uh, philosophical questions if you don't mind number one is what's your personal philosophy what's something that gets you out of bed in the morning what's something that drives you or what's your equation for happiness these are different questions or the same yeah those are all different questions oh all different but i'll give you like my life philosophy okay yes like how i think that i Mm -hmm. i want to live my life i genuinely believe that you can put if you put out positive energy you will receive positive energy And I think that people can feel positive energy and negative energy like as soon as you approach them, Um, especially if you're like in tuned with this. And it sounds like super like mystical, blah, blah, blah. But it really is like the way that you talk to yourself in your head, um, the way that you speak to others and treat others, the way that you treat even animals, like the way that you treat your environment and like these things, they you can put out positive energy or you can be really self-deprecating and really hateful and negative and like always have negative thoughts and that puts out a negative energy and I think that as long as long as I'm on the positive side I will attract positive energy and positive people in my life and if I'm on the negative side then things only get worse because I'm attracting negative energy so that's like kind of my life philosophy did that answer the question yeah 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 it sounds very much like law of attraction it is law of attraction yeah and and it has i'm like also a more spiritual person Mm -hmm. and there's so much of like being spiritual that's rooted in physics like the law of attraction or like energy cannot be created nor destroyed and my opinion of how that manifests is that like every human has an energy and that's what other cultures call a soul right and like when you die your energy cannot be created or destroyed it can only be transferred so your energy is like transferred somewhere else whether that is like your body decomposing and transferring into the ground or whether that is like some people believe in reincarnation of reincarnating as something else i don't know exactly how that works but all i know is that like every person has an energy and you should work on making that like more positive and strengthening it yeah that's very striking that's very impressive (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. And what's one piece of advice you would give your 16-year-old self if you could go back in time? Mm. I was really different at 16. <laughs> um, I think it would be like don't get so caught up in what other people think of you because people are always going to talk whether it's true or false or good or bad, like the way that other people are talking about you should not have an effect on how you see yourself. And that's how, that's what I would have told my 16 year old self because at the time, like I was in high school and there was like a lot of like just stupid drama and like rumors and it was, it felt very insulated. And I wish I had known then just like, it doesn't matter what people are saying, focus on yourself and focus on your growth. And like those people that are talking bad are temporary, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, that's so true. I feel like there is no reality. It only exists in our mind. Yeah, exactly. And what we think of ourselves is what really matters at the end of the day, not what other people do. Yeah. There was this really uh, interesting video that I saw once that was like, if somebody's yelling at you Mm -hmm. 
and calling you these terrible, terrible names, you feel so bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're like, oh, you're stupid. You're this, you're that saying like terrible things. But if they were yelling at you in a different language, a language mm -hmm. you didn't understand, oh, yeah. it would have no effect on you. Cause you're like, I don't know what this crazy person is screaming <laughs> about because I don't understand them. Yeah. And that's how we should take what other people say to us and about us. Like, like it shouldn't have any effect on us because it doesn't actually affect who you are. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But, Absolutely. Yeah. It just takes maturity to come to all these realizations. Yeah, like when exactly. we're young, we don't really realize. We, yeah. We're just so insecure. Right. And yeah. my parents used to tell me these things, mm -hmm. but you don't understand them until you go through it yourself, yeah. you know? Yeah. And one final question. How does it feel to be your age? I love it. Uh -huh. I love being 23. <laughs> like when I was little, I thought being like 21 and 23 and 27 was like the coolest thing ever. And it actually is <laughs> like, I feel so sure of my personality. Like I'm still growing and there's definitely things I need to work on, but like, I'm proud of how far I've come. Like I'm developing my sense of style and like what I want to do with my life. And like, I don't know. I know myself. I know my friends, my family. Like I think I'm nicer now than I was when I was a teenager. Um, I just like being 23. I feel like I'm still young enough to where it's like fun, but uh -huh. I'm old enough to where people can respect me if they choose to. So I like this middle ground. Um, and it's like an exciting age. Like I'm continuing my education. I'm at the beginning of my career. Um, there's so many more people that I'm gonna meet in my life. So it's it's like, a, it's a good age. I'm, ex I'm excited. Yeah, things are just getting started and there's so much yeah. to be excited for. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. All right. It was such a blast today talking to you, yeah, Miss you Sunny. Yeah, it was awesome. And Sweet. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I definitely did. Yeah. And guys, hope you liked our episode today. And are there any comments you'd like to make before we wrap this up? Final remarks? Um, Would you like to say anything no, to our I, audience? I, I really enjoyed this. Uh -huh. And if you're listening to this, props to you because I speak really fast. <laughs> so if you understand what I'm saying in English, that's amazing. And keep working on your English journey. Keep listening to podcasts like this. Mm -hmm. This is an incredible podcast that you do. Oh, thanks. Bringing people on to speak English and just talking. Um, it's awesome. So I'm promoting Ad Astra. <laughs> it's, it's a great place. And the students that are behind the camera are also fantastic. So Thank you so much. I really appreciate and it. And thanks for coming down here. Thanks for yeah, being here again. Of course. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you liked our content, please, please hit the subscribe button and leave your comments in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace. <laughs>